board. If you don't mind, uh, please turn on your camera. Uh, I find it always uh, better for the speakers uh, to get in contact with you to see uh, your faces. It's not a must, but uh, if you don't mind, uh, so we can have an, an impression of, of, of you. My name is Andre Wermelinger. I'm the founder of Free the Bees, and uh, I have the pleasure to lead this conference tonight with you, with two great speakers. And uh, this Bees Without Borders conference, uh, it's a partnership. It's not only Free the Bees in Switzerland, it's together with Honey Bee Wild in Luxembourg, uh, with Apis Arborea in, in the USA, and the Natural Beekeeping Trust in England. And we aim to promote awareness and understanding of honeybees and other pollinators. And we try and we present new topics on a regular and, if possible, monthly basis. So you will find on our web pages uh, the, next, uh, the next speeches too. So <clears throat> this evening we have two very interesting speakers uh, with Hartmut Jungius and Przemek Navrocki. Uh, they are somehow or not somehow, they are the very source of all the tree beekeeping activities in Central and Western Europe. So if you want to know more how, uh, what, what about tree beekeeping and uh, about the history, uh, you are tonight at the very source. Uh, you will find a detailed description on both of them uh, on the Free the Bees webpage, as both of them are members of the Scientific Council. So uh, I don't want to go into details, uh, just uh, some very few words on, on both of them. We have Hartmut Jungius as a biologist and geographer. Uh, he has led many nature and environmental protection projects, uh, a very specialist uh, on, on these themes. And uh, Hartmut, he worked for the UNESCO, for WWF and the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources. Then we have Przemek Navrocki. Uh, he's also a biologist, a specialist in river and wetland ecology, in bird studies and nature conservation. Mm -hmm. He has been working for the WWF uh, Poland since 1997. And uh, he is involved in various uh, projects aimed at the conservation of river and forest ecosystems. So both of you, uh, you are very welcome to uh, talk a little bit more about yourself and, and your uh, history. So the conference tonight will be recorded uh, and uh, it will be put online. Uh, I guess uh, no one will see uh, your cameras. It's, not, it's only the speaker and the, uh, and the, and the slides. So now uh, enough for, uh, from my side and a warm welcome to Hartmut Jungius. Uh, I'm really glad to have you here and to listen to your speech. Hartmut, thank you. Okay, thank you, André. Um, a brief introduction of myself to add a little bit to what um, André told you already. I worked for about, let's say, 50 years of nature conservation. I started very early with a fellowship um, for national parks and, uh, and reserves in Canada and in the US, where I familiarized myself with these uh, conservation concepts. Afterwards, I um, had a chance to study antelopes in South Africa, in the Kruger National Park, where I was for more than a year. I did my thesis there. Coming back from South Africa, I uh, had a chance to go to Latin America, working on Vicuña conservation and advising the Bolivian government also in protected areas and setting up a network of protected areas in the country. And this then brought me into contact, the contact with UNESCO, brought me into contact with IUCN and in contact with WWF. And that's where I finally landed. Um, in WWF, I joined in 60, no, in 1970, 
but it was a very small organization with only six people. And at the time I was the only conservationist. And uh, today WWF worldwide has about five or even 6,000 people working in different countries. Um, my last position in WWF was a director for Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And in um, this capacity, I worked a lot in Russia for more than 10 years. And that included also my work in the Ural Mountains, where we were also working on protected areas, in particular areas for sustainable use, including sustainable use by the local population. And in this context, I came across tree beekeeping, and I will show you some pictures and talk, tell you more about it. And this contact um, with tree beekeeping in the Ural put me then also into contact with Free the Bees. I was so excited about tree beekeeping, which is an old tradition in Central and Eastern Europe and has completely, almost completely disappeared. I got very excited about it and I started thinking together with my friend Jimmy, hey, how can we get it back? And one day, my dear wife, if she was reading a natural resources journal or something like this and said, well, hey, here is an article about an organization called Free the Bees. Isn't that something which would interest you? I said, well, hey, that sounds great. Give me the address. I've got the address. And there was a man called Andre Wermelinger I should write to. And here he is. And I wrote to him. And I told him all about tree beekeeping and what we call in German Zeitlerei. And Andre got excited and says, well, hey, that's something which fits into our program. And that's how we got together. And that's how we landed. Uh, I landed in this organization. And uh, I must say, I'm very happy to be there. Um, I'm retired since a long time from nature conservation, from WWF, not from nature conservation. And um, I used to work as a consultant, as an advisor um, for projects uh, still in Central Asia, in the Caucasus. But since a couple of years, I have given up these activities and I just look after my garden, look after our little nature reserve, just at the foot of the Jura Mountains and try and support free the bees to the best of my abilities. And now, should I start with my presentation? Yes, please, Arnold. Then we have to switch off. OK. <clears throat> now, I want to talk to you about Zeitlerei, or tree beaking, as it's called in English. It is a contribution to biodiversity, as we understand it. and maintenance and management of natural forest ecosystems. The traditional home of the honeybee are hollows in old trees. I think that's what we must become aware of when we talk about tree beekeeping. The bee- Arthur, Arthur, you, don't, you don't share your screen yet. I don't share the screen? No, not yet. Oh, why not? Bildschirm freigeben. Bildschirm freigeben. Now, <clears throat> now it should work. That's it. And now presentation mode. Hold on, I will start again from the beginning. Here we are. Thank you. Everything okay now? <clears throat> okay, start again. I want to talk about Zeitlerei, as we call it in German, tree beaking in English, which in my view is an important contribution to biodiversity. And it promotes also and requires maintenance and management of natural forest ecosystems. When talking about tree beekeeping, we must be aware that the honeybee lives in trees. The traditional home of the honeybee are holes in old trees. And its whole biology, biology is adapted to this. It is the only honeybee species which we have in Europe. It lives from the Pyrenees to the Ural Mountains, <clears throat> and it prefers mixed old growth forests with glades and wetlands. <clears throat> 
Most of our forests suffer from intensive use and are shaped by intensive use. The result of this is that microhabitats are missing. Microhabitats are dead wood, old trees, holes and hollows, root plates, and phytotelmen. Phytotelmen are small bodies of water in trees. Dead wood is very important, standing dead wood and also lying dead wood. And the old trees, I always call these dead wood and old trees centers of biodiversity because they are home for hundreds of different species of animals and plants. Part of forest diversity should be glades. These are open pastures in forests and wetlands. And tree beekeeping depends on this type of biodiversity and can help to restore it, at least to some extent. <clears throat> Tree beekeeping, Zeitlerei, is an ancient craft, as you can see from this drawing, which I picked up from an old book. <clears throat> it is a commercial collection of honey and wax, and it was regulated by law since the Middle Ages. Honey was collected because it was the only sweetener in the old days, and it was also the product of meat, which is an alcoholic drink, a sweet alcoholic drink, and the wax. Wax was used for candles, but also for sealing documents. It was a very, very important product. That's why the position of the side lamp was a very important one, and the side lamp was part of forest management in these old days. On this drawing, you see the Zeitland in the middle of the picture, and you see the Zeitlers also on the trees. The Zeitler is wearing a weapon, which means he was one of the very few persons who was allowed to enter the forest with a weapon to defend himself against poachers and also against wild animals. The picture shows you also how the Seidler in the olden days was working. He was creating a nesting facility in old trees. He used pine, spruce, fir, or oak. Here you see the nesting facilities. It's about a meter long, and it was cut by the Seidler. There you see the other one. Eh? And the tree which he used for his, for his, for his beehive was marked. You see here the mark at the bottom? Each Seidler has his own private mark, which identified the tree as his property. Somebody who was cutting the tree, it was penalized with death. It was, was very, very, very great, great problem if this would happen. The Seidler used to climb the trees in a different way. This guy is climbing his with a rope, and that guy is climbing it with a leather. And both of them have traditional tools in hand. He has an axe with which he opens the hive. This one has a big spoon with which he cuts, cuts the combs out of the hive. That guy is smoking uh, to get rid of the bees. And here are the helpers at the the base of the tree to whom he gives down the honey or who give him up the equipment which it needs. These kind of trees were put into mixed forests and glades with glades and wetlands. The important thing was they needed all year round flowering plants, trees and shrubs. In this drawing we see also here this block, this log. It's a log hive Klotzbeute in German. This was the first tool which facilitated beekeeping in settlements, which means a piece of an old tree was cut and into this tree trunk, the hole was then being made by the, tree, by the beekeeper and it was placed in his house, in his garden, and he had the bees at home. So it was the first step to domestication we also make we say the first step of domestic keeping the bee as a domesticated animal near the settlement. Reactivating tree beekeeping would not only promote 
old cultural tradition, but it would also promote biodiversity in forests. And now let me take you to the Southern Ural in Russia. Here you see a picture of this type of forest where the old traditional tree beekeeping custom is still practiced, an old pine tree, and the tree beekeeper is climbing up with a rope to his hive. Below at the bottom, a helper is standing and waiting what he can do for him or what he gets from above. Eastern Ural, it's here, there's this part of the mountain range. It's called Bashkiria. It's where the Bashkir people are living in non-Russian indigenous population. The Southern Ural forest ecosystem includes the eastern border of the European broad-leafed forests with a variety of trees, oak, linden, maple, elm, and aspen. Also coniferous forests with pine, spruce, fir, and larch. Inside the forest, we find different types of bogs and wetlands, forest glades. The forest glades are grazed by cattle of local people. And in the higher areas at the edge of the mountains, there are mountain forest step. All this together is a highly diverse and ecosystem with well-structured forest, the basis for a successful bee pasture, I may say. In German, the word is eine Zeitlerweide, a bee pasture. Here you have a picture in autumn of the forest, this broadleafed forest, mixed forest. In the middle of the picture, you see a glade, and there are some bogs. There is mountain step, so that's where the tree beekeepers are living. A very important element of this forest are lime trees. It's the small leafed lime, which um, we found here. It is also growing in our part of the world. It flowers between June and July, and is very, very important for the honey production. The linden tree is also important for another reason. It provides the local people with essential tools. It provides wood for carving. What are the people carving? They are carving knives. These knives are being used to cut the honeycombs out of the hive. For containers of honey, you will see that later on in the pictures. You may remember it also from the drawing from the olden days. These containers into which the honey is being put are from linden wood. Then the inner bark of the linden tree is called bast in German. It's being used for ropes, ropes to climb the tree. It's used for making containers and to make shoes. In German, we have the word basteln. And the word basteln includes the word bast, because with bast, many, many various things were produced in the olden days. That's where the word comes from. And last but not least, the medical values of the flowers of the linden tree are very well known until today. Wetlands are very important for a successful um, Zeitlerei. Flowering plants from early spring to late autumn, in particular the spring flowers are very important. In willows, slow, alder buckthorn. Alder buckthorn is called faulbaum. Then the wild bog myrt, which is a gagelstrauch, and many, many more. Here you see a typical forest glade in the Ural, which is grazed by cattle, and you see it's full, full of flowers which are an important pasture for bees. This is a Bashkir village at the foot of the mountains. These people are self-sufficient. All what they need, they get from the forest, from their gardens, from their agriculture. And 50% of them are beekeepers. They are beekeepers also in the modern sense, but also in the traditional sense. They are working with log hives. 
the log hive you saw already in the old drawing in the old painting. So these people are still using log hives. The log hive is part of a big tree which has been cut and into which a cave, a hollow, is being made. It's the oldest artificial transportable beehive. And in Central Europe, it's known since 3380 from a log hive, which was made out of pine wood from a village called Arbon Bleiche. It's in Switzerland, I think, or in Germany, on the Lake Constance, on the shore of Lake Constance. In the museum, it can be seen there. And it's typical, it has all the necessary characteristics which we know from a log hive. It has the hole into which, which is left for the bees to get in. It has the lid with which the log hive is closed. All that has been found. So it's a very, very old tradition, which is going back to the Stone Age, which means in those days, the people had already log hives and certainly they were also having hives in trees. Why a log hive? A log hive protects the bee from rain and snow, from bears and martens, it's put in the tree. In other parts of the world, in Southern Europe, they people use pottery. I know it also from the Arab Peninsula, for instance, they use pottery. Or they used also in Central Europe and Middle Europe, straw hives, I think most of us uh, will know these too. <clears throat> How is the log hive being done? <clears throat> Preparing a log hive starts in springtime, in springtime. So the beekeeper hollows a hole, cuts a hole into the log about 30 centimeters deep, and it should be a container for about 30 liters. He adds one or more fluglöcher. I don't know the English name for this. That's where, Jeremy, what is the English name for a flugloch? He will be able to tell us. Um, the uh, Zeitler keeps it open until autumn, until autumn, because it must dry. And he places it into a pine tree in this case, in an area the pine tree is surrounded by glades, by linden trees, and by wetlands. So it means it has a high diversity of different plants around it. He carves also his ownership mark. It's, you can't see it here, but he carves also his ownership in mark into the log hive, and then he waits for bees to settle. He closes it in autumn, which means it remains open, perhaps from spring, let's say from March until September, October. Then it's closed, and then he waits for bees to settle it. The other technique, and that is the most traditional one, that is a tree beehive. A tree beehive, well, to cut a tree beehive into an existing big tree is a similar procedure than for the log hive. It's also done in autumn, in springtime, and it's closed in autumn. And um, I would like to tell you now how a tree hive has to be, a tree for a tree hive has to be prepared or is being prepared in the Ural. So the tree beekeeper, he selects a pine tree, which is 150 to 200 years old. It is not ready yet for a hive because it's not big enough. So what is he doing? He cuts the top. The tree stops to growing, to grow um, on the top and he becomes wider. All the energy goes now into the trunk to make it a wide trunk. He selects a tree in a mixed forest with linden and wetland and glades. He cuts his family sign, a tamga, into the base of the tree. And he waits for 30, 70 years to make the hollow. For 70 years. So the tree is 200 years old. He waits for 70 years before it's big enough to make a hollow. It must have a diameter of about one meter. Trees in the Ural are growing much slower than in our part of the world. In our part of the world, it might not take that long, but that's where it takes in the Ural. Six to 12 meters above ground, he cuts the hole. And this is high enough 
to avoid that pine martens or bears go in there. And he leaves it open for about a year and then he closes it. The hole is about a meter long, a meter long and about 30 centimeters deep. That means the tree is ready when it's 220 to 270 years old. That means the father, the man, the father, prepares a tree for his son or for his grandson. That's the perspective in which these people in that part of the world are still thinking. Similar techniques were used in Central Europe. This is a photograph from Poland. The guy is not climbing with a rope, he's climbing with a leather, but the tree has also been cut in the top to make it wider. I think Chemek will show a similar picture to us later. Now, where do I come across all this? It was the Sulgantash Nature Reserve in the Southern Ural. It was established in 1958 with the objective to preserve the Bursan honeybee. It's a dark European honeybee, Apis mellifera mellifera. The reserve includes old growth forest with all this diversity of habitats, which I showed to you earlier. It is also an area which is important from an archaeological point of view. There are the Kapova caves with um, old drawings and paintings from the Stone Age. It has a karst landscape, which provides a high diversity in different biotopes. And the rangers of these reserves, they are working as tree beekeepers. And here you see one of them. This is one of these old pine trees, which has been selected for a hole, and he is climbing up the tree with a rope. And this is a traditional way of climbing trees. Remember the drawing which I showed you, one of the tree beekeepers, the Zeitler, he also climbed up with a rope. And they carry this piece of log with them. You will see that later on, let's see, piece of log he is standing on when he has reached his hive. Here he is, upstairs as we may say. He has established also this log on which he can stand. He pulls up the smoker and here he opens the hive. It's closed with the log, he takes the log off and that's where the opening is for the bees to enter the hive. There he has the X with which he opened the hole. And here you see him taking out the honeycombs. He puts these honeycombs into this linden container and the linden container is passed down to somebody who is waiting at the bottom of the tree to receive the harvest. There he is with his little son who gets a taste of the honey and you see the container is full, full with combs and he might be the one who is then using a tree which was prepared not by his father but by his grandfather. The reserve has about 22,500 hectares. In the forest there are two, 700 log or tree hives. It sounds a lot, but in the old literature, and uh, I, I don't know if you can see this, these are some of the old books about Waldbienenzucht. Um, I can give you the information if you want it. They are writing about Zeitler communities, which num numbered up to seven, which were managing up to 700, 7,000, which were managing up to 7,000 hives, 7,000 hives. Right? So there were large parts of forest which were used by them. Back to Sulgantash. Each of these uh, beekeepers is managing 50 to 20 tree or log hives. In Germany, the literature says a Zeitler was managing up to 60 log hives. There are three log hives per square kilometer 
in the nature reserve. One hive is occupied, which means 30% of the hives are occupied and the rest is open, is, a, is free for use by other animals, which means an untold abundance of habitats are free for other cave dwellers. And that is the point which where tree beekeeping can make a significant contribution and add to biodiversity in forest ecosystems. Harvest in the Ural is happening in September. In Germany, the old records say up to three harvests were possible. In April, May from wild cherry, alder buckthorn, that is again the fowl balm, and early spring flowering plants. And the second or third one in July, August, or in September. Harvest in September, the tree beakers in Ural, they harvest 15 to 25 kilo from each colony. And this honey is said, or I was told, has particular values. It's rich in enzymes and in vitamins, in amino acid, in hormones, and bee bread and wax. And this honey is very expensive. The kilo costs in the region 50 euros, and in Moscow, 120 to 200 euros the kilo. This was, I must say, in 2010. The prices might have changed, but I don't think that they have gone down. So, to summarize, tree beekeeping is an ancient form of land use and contributing to maintaining a rich, dynamic, and diverse forest ecosystem. The picture you see again, the tree beekeeper. Here is the open hive, about a meter. Here is the flugloch for the beans, and here is part of his equipment. And he is climbing up with a rope. The tree beekeeper is a special person. He respects the bees' biologies. He does not prevent swarming. He lets the bee form whenever they feel it's necessary. And he helps to build robust populations which interact with the environment without human interference. And it was our ambition to get this old tradition back to Europe. And with my good colleague and friend, Cemek, we thought about it. And Cemek said, well, hey, Let's try this in Poland. I think our country is ready for it because Poland is a country which has a long, long tradition in tree beekeeping. And that's what happened. And this is the first tree which was turned into a tree beehive by Polish tree beekeepers. And Czemek will tell more about this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Armut. Perfect. Very interesting. Uh, we, we have now time for some uh, couple of questions. So feel free uh, to ask questions. You can raise your electronic hands uh, or put your question in, in the chat, but it's better if you ask your question directly. Just try to see. Does anyone raise his hands? I cannot really see all the persons. Who would like to ask a question? Certainly, there are a lot of. Otherwise, I start with mine. Uh, Hartmut, you certainly know why it is possible that in the market, uh, on the market in Moscow, uh, they can reach up to 200 euros per kilogram of honey. Uh, my hypothesis is that they look at it much more as a medical treatment than as a something to eat, but uh, I've never been able to clarify this. There's a myth around this honey. There's a myth, I think that's what it is. Eh? It's, a, it's a honey which you don't get. And they sell the honey with the combs or without the combs. You can uh, make a choice. Eh? And uh, 
I think it's a story around it. It comes from a remote part of the country. It comes from an, ind an indigenous population from the uh, Bashkir people. And um, it is not only an old uh, technology of harvest, it's also an old tradition, an old culture, you may say. And all around it, well, creates a myth of this honey that this is a very special product. And, and I must say, well, uh, my my son-in-law he suffered he suffered from Heuschnupfen. What is that in English? This is hay fever, hay fever. Yeah, and uh, I brought the honey back uh, from the Ural. I was given it. I didn't have to buy it. And I told him, I said, Olivier, please take a spoon of this honey every morning before when the season is on. And he told me, well, it helped. It didn't get away completely, but he suffered much less from uh, from the safety. But so at least I have a little test which might prove that this is a very special and unique product. Perfect. And one thing I forgot to say, and I think I should say that also, uh, there are these empty hives. That means uh, only one third of the hives is occupied. It we do not know how these empty hives are being repopulated if they are being repopulated from the population within the forest, or if these are migratory swarms from the apiaries in the villages. It may very well be both. And that's something uh, Chemik is also working on, and he may also tell us a little bit more about it. Um, that is a very, very interesting, uh, very interesting, uh, well, I would say piece of research of study, uh, which one uh, would have to make. Um, Thank you. So we have another question from Felix. Felix. Can you hear me? Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, um, I first, uh, thanks a lot for these insights. Um, as I was traveling to Bashkiria two times myself, and I was asking these questions about the prices <laughs> also, uh, I might be, able to add a little bit to what Hartmut already explained. And that is um, that in the early 90s, um, this whole tradition of tree beekeeping was uh, very close to get lost completely during the time of the breakdown of the Soviet Union. And the park director of the Shulgan Tash took the decision. It was really a decision to raise the prices of the honey there. Um, and he was able to do that as particularly um, the honey from Bashkiria was already very famous in all over Russia, but of course in the big cities, um, due to the taste of lime tree. And they labeled is, it Diki um, Miot, uh, which means wild honey. And this wild honey became a delicatess, just like, um, like, uh, all sorts of delicatesses, you know, from Russia. And this is how they played it. It was really a political decision and it helped to, to bring money to the families to preserve the knowledge. And so this is how they actually also saved tree beekeeping tradition there. Yeah, very good. Yeah. I just wanted to add that. So there's a story, there's a story around it and uh, that makes it, yeah. Wild honey, that's another very important thing. <laughs> argument for selling yeah. <laughs> okay so let's switch over thank you Hartmut. Uh, let's switch over to Przemek uh, and you will have again uh, a moment for some questions at the end of the, of the conference Shemek, I don't know, are you speaking? No, uh, I tried to okay. put the microphone on. Yes, here it works. So hello, everybody. It's very nice to be here. So I will continue from this moment when Hartmut stops from, from uh, switching from this uh, exotic place uh, far away on the, from the corners of Europe to, uh, to Poland. 
As Hartmut mentioned, uh, we decided that uh, it would be really interesting to, to think about bringing uh, tree beekeeping back to Poland for two reasons. First of all, that tree beekeeping, it's a common tradition of uh, Eastern and Central Europe. It is a unique uh, heritage, cultural heritage, ranges from Ural to the Eastern Germany. And this is more or less the same uh, tradition uh, which uh, varies in uh, little details. And um, what is uh, also very important, um, Poland lost this tradition relatively recently, about 100 years ago. There was, even after the Second uh, World War, there were still beekeepers practicing this profession in eastern corners of Poland. So the memory of tree beekeeping was uh, vivid. Nearly everybody in Poland knew that there is uh, something like tree beekeeping, uh, tree beekeeper, Zeidler, usually they were connecting these uh, stories with uh, brave men fighting birds to protect uh, honey, etc. And of course, uh, because uh, we are both nature conservationists, we thought that it would be a really great idea to think uh, about tree beekeeping in similar way like it's done in Ural, as, uh, where the tree beekeeping is considered a tool for protecting, uh, vanishing, free living uh, honeybees. So we thought that uh, tree beekeeping may help to protect uh, that what was left from the population of free living honeybees in Polish forest and also will help to protect uh, old trees because as Hartmut mentioned to make a tree hive you need a really old tree which is not that common in managed forests in Europe and of course uh, this cultural cultural heritage um, it's uh, something which uh, always is uh, worth to, uh, to care for, having in mind how quickly this traditional way of uh, land use uh, are vanishing. Then uh, we decided to, uh, to start this project uh, of restoring tree beekeeping in Poland in 2006. Help was provided by tree beekeeping master from uh, Shulgantas, from this very place Hartmut described. We had partners uh, among uh, bird uh, protecting uh, society who had much broader attitude, protecting also bumblebees, traditional gardens, etc. We cooperated with three national parks. And uh, that way we were able to, to start this traditional uh, beekeeping in, uh, in several places. And one of them, <clears throat> was so-called Pusha Pilicka forest in the central part of Poland, not far away from Warsaw, where we have decided it will be a very good place to start with, having in mind that there are nice old pines available, also river valley, and protected area in the form of a landscape park. We wanted, first of all, to get from uh, our Bashkir masters that piece of knowledge, which uh, is traditionally passed from father to son. This type of knowledge was lost in Poland. We had um, museums uh, uh, full of artifacts, old books, but this oral knowledge, uh, really important, uh, was lost. For that reason, we combined uh, examining um, museum collections and also visiting uh, Belarus and Ukraine when there are some forms of tree beekeeping still alive. But our main source of information, how to uh, deal with uh, tree beekeeping in modern days were our the Bashkir friends. We asked them not to present the, uh, the ancient technique, but uh, modern way of uh, uh, making, um, for instance, um, a tree hive. That means that um, 
they were free to choose traditional tools like an axe, which uh, which has history of thousands of years and a chainsaw. We wanted to uh, to see how it is um, uh, the best way to to build a hive uh, in modern days in in the fastest and most uh, efficient way. So at the beginning, our tree beekeeping students uh, watch the masters. Then they learn how to safely climb trees. Safety is really key issue in this uh, profession. And by the way, I would recommend uh, more this uh, Bashkir way of uh, using the, the belt, which you can see on, uh, on this photo in comparison to, to this uh, central uh, European way of climbing tree with very sophisticated rope system, which is uh, really in, uh, uh, great in terms of sophistication, but also at the same time very dangerous. So the next uh, stage um, of this uh, learning process was to make own uh, tree hive under watchful eye of Bashkir masters. And you can see on, on this photo, Andrzej, one of our friends whom many of you uh, know in person, and uh, Tomek, who was the, the second uh, student in the uh, Puszcza Pilicka forest, learning how to make the, the hive and how to attract uh, eventually bees when the hive is ready using a bait uh, in form of pieces of uh, honeycomb attached to the ceiling with uh, nails uh, made out of a very special hard wood uh, of one of the forest bush. The next stage of this training was visiting Ural. We took our tree keeping students to the Shulgantash to show them how honey is harvested and to learn uh, directly from the masters from Ural, how to care for bees, to feed them or not to feed them, how to harvest honey in that way that um, it will not harm the colony, how to cut um, combs to create an uh, air cushion to, to uh, facilitate uh, wintering uh, of the colony, etc. So we wanted to learn all these uh, little but very important details, which may be very important uh, in way of uh, trying to transplant this uh, knowledge to Poland. And on this uh, photo, you will see a log hanging uh, uh, from a, a branch, which um, is intended to knock down the bird. I think that nearly everybody who started to be interested in tree beekeeping, hear the stories that uh, tree beekeepers were using very sophisticated techniques to protect the uh, uh, tree with um, uh, the, uh, the colony against birds. But we learned from our Bashkir master that actually this log doesn't work. <laughs> they keep it only for tourists because if bear really wants to get to to the tree hive, it will always uh, find the, uh, the way. And it around that, to our surprise, uh, the really important uh, enemy of um, bees living in tree hives is not the, the bear. However, sometimes they really can destroy hives, but uh, pine marten and uh, also woodpeckers. Commenting on that, I would add a story from ancient Poland, where the Polish tree keepers were obliged to provide um, pellets from pine uh, marten to, to the king as a return uh, for sort of reward for, for the right of using forest for tree keeping. And I think it was all, uh, uh, working in uh, two ways, that from one hand uh, it was delivering to, to the king and noble people's uh, purse which were valued, but also it was a way of reducing very important enemy of uh, bees living in, in the forest. That means uh, increasing honey production. 
Then came uh, the stage three, gathering our own experience after training, which uh, took two years, learning uh, by the own experiences, also sharing that what we learn from our Bashkir masters, whom we are really grateful. For me, uh, showing this picture is always uh, uh, the moment to, to remember about these great people and to thank them for that what they, they did for us. So we try to, to continue this chain of goodwill and to, uh, to show everything what we learn to, to anybody who is interested. And that way we came across Andre, as Hartmut mentioned, Andre made the tour really quick tour planned with Swiss precision, with the, the degree of precision of 10 minutes, visiting uh, about 20 places all around Poland to show him every important uh, place, important from the uh, perspective of restitution of, of tribute keeping. And th that gave Andre idea to start organizing workshops on uh, tribute keeping. And that's why Tribe keeping restoration across uh, borders of Poland and enter first Switzerland, Ge then Germany, and now many other countries. So th this is also for me always occasion to opportunity to thank Andre, Frank, Norbert, Heinz, and many other great people whom you know who contributed to uh, development of this idea. And now we can say that after this already. 15 years of the restoration project, we have minimum 100 people across Europe who have knowledge uh, broad enough to, uh, to build a hive and to care properly uh, for the bees. The, the tree beekeeping um, enthusiast um, gradually uh, started to uh, spread all over the Poland, starting from uh, Puszcza Pilicka Forest, uh, from Biebrza National Park, Vigri National Park, and especially this cluster is very interesting because that shows um, not only individual uh, beekeeping enthusiasts, but also activity of Polish state forest, who got really interested, the Polish foresters, in, uh, in this idea of tree beekeeping, and they started direct cooperation with Sulgantash, uh, learning directly from Ural masters, uh, building uh, own uh, tree hives, uh, tree log hives. They were producing uh, books on uh, flowering plants in forests. They made research on legal aspects of tree beekeeping in Polish forests. And then came a really big surprise after reaching stage of about 100 uh, tree and, and tree lockouts in Poland, where we learned that uh, in southern Poland, one of the Polish state forest district decided to put 1,000 uh, lockouts uh, at once in one piece of forest, which was um, similar in size to Sulgantash. That means uh, the bees will have uh, in this area even more available places than uh, eventually was developed by tree keepers in Ural. This is a very interesting um, experiment, and it will be really interesting uh, to see after several years uh, what what will happen to to this uh, population. And not um, uh, long ago. Another Polish state forest project started in northeastern part of Poland, which is very interesting also in that way that um, in this area survived a primitive breed of uh, bees, which genetically is very closely related to Apis mellifera mellifera. And this tree keeping project combines also protecting this uh, primitive breed. So having in mind that what Hartmut mentioned that uh, bees in the forest uh, rely also on the source of uh, the swarm, uh, uh, not necessarily coming from forest bees, but also from the apiaries, it can be very interesting way of combining uh, apiary beekeeping and um, nature 
uh, uh, conservation uh, run in similar manner like in Surgantar. That means uh, providing uh, good breeding places for bee colonies in the forest. And coming back again to Polish uh, state forest, they also initiated very interesting event, which was or organized already nine times, so-called Barciowisko. This is a, a competition uh, on making uh, log hives. It was uh, based on example from Ural. In Chulgantash, it's annually done as well. That uh, gave uh, idea what the, the log hive is uh, to common audience and that created a lot of interest and that way uh, the message about tree keeping and also amount of log hives uh, created which eventually some of them at least uh, land in the forest it's also an interesting way how to in, increase impact of tree keeping on improving condition of uh, pre-living uh, colonies in in the forest we had also unexpected success. We even uh, didn't think about it uh, when uh, 15 years ago, we started to hard uh, this um, tribe keeping restoration. Uh, tribe keeping received really warm welcome in Poland. And because it uh, as a way of uh, traditional use of forests, uh, it became known in Western Europe generally, brought back interest uh, for this um, ancient profession to Poland, Belarus, and Ukraine. The group of uh, tribe keeping enthusiasts who were especially focused on this uh, cultural heritage issues, supported by ministries of cultural heritage in Poland and Belarus, initiated um, efforts to inscribe um, tribe keeping on a list of uh, cultural heritage of humanity and that was a really big success in 2020 tribe keeping culture in poland and belarus uh, was inscribed on this list and on this photo you can see the ceremony in the polish ministry of cultural heritage where uh, tribe keepers uh, from poland uh, who supported this idea and the representative of various organizations are receiving diplomas on that occasion. So we may say that uh, tree beekeeping, thanks to effort of Hartmut, that everything started from him, so, uh, with support of our the great friends from Shulgantash, and then followed by Andre and our great friends from all over the Europe, Tribe keeping uh, returned to Europe. It's still now present in the humans' uh, minds, and we may be sure that it will not uh, die out, that it will develop. But there are also, unfortunately, some disappointments. First of all, when we uh, came uh, with this idea of tribe keeping to Polish managed forest, we made assumption that uh, the biggest problem is lack of uh, ancient uh, big trees which uh, provide uh, natural hollows for pre-living uh, honeybees and then the tree keeping like in Ural will compensate for, for the shortage of, of tree hives. Generally, tree hive, by the way, is much better on average than natural hole because it's um, generally predators proof, contrary to, for instance, natural um, uh, hollows, which uh, were started for from the, the hole made by a large woodpecker, like black woodpecker. Such hollows can be easily entered by a pine marten. But uh, <clears throat> this assumption turned out to be correct. Uh, all these uh, log hives and tree hives we put in the forest were occupied by bees. However, what was missing was the honey, the most important uh, aspect of uh, tree beekeeping. We quickly learned that uh, the bees in the forest starve. 
and because they have so little food um, they have uh, relatively uh, uh, low uh, sur winter survival and usually not enough honey to share with uh, a tree beekeeper so the honey harvest actually will not be at that moment uh, motivation for uh, this profession of uh, tree beekeeper it's worth to mention that in ancient poland tree beekeeping uh, delivered the most uh, prized product of the forest the honey were more more important than timber several hundred years ago but now in uh, at least in managed forests in central uh, poland and most likely it will be true also for majority of, of germany and perhaps some other countries tree beekeeping should be motivated uh, in other way than honey production like for instance uh, protection of cultural heritage what is happening now with really great successes as i mentioned and nature protection we have uh, now uh, quite rich experience uh, about uh, the way tree beekeeping can work um, to protect free living uh, honeybee the colonies in uh, an example of this Pilitska forest that means in, in a commercial pine dominated uh, forest which uh, now cover majority of lowland Europe now we learn that uh, it will be good tool but the task of restoring a strong population of honeybee will not be easy if you are interested i will be happy to uh, present you more details on that on february and now because our time is running out i will stop here thank you very much for your attention Thank you very much, uh, Przemek. Uh, very interesting. As you already said, uh, in February, we will create a second uh, conference with you as a main speaker, where you can go into details. Uh, you have a lot of data, a lot of knowledge, uh, experience and in the practical field. So this will be of big interest. And you will find the conference for February soon on the web page. Uh, so just uh, follow uh, all the conferences so you will find it there. Now, uh, we don't have a lot of time, but uh, just uh, two or three questions would be uh, great anyway. So do you have some more questions to Przemek, to Hartmut as well? No questions or you don't really have the courage to ask questions. All right, I mean, as we run out of time, uh, let's leave it like this. Uh, I'm sure there are questions coming on. Uh, and uh, if you have questions, you find the names and the addresses uh, of Hartmut, Przemek, uh, myself on the website of Free the Bees. So uh, don't hesitate to write emails uh, if you want to know more. And the recordings we will put to YouTube uh, so you will be able to re see what was presented. And uh, Tartmut, Przemek, thank you very much for your time, uh, for your insights, and to everyone participating, thank you for your interest and your time as well. And uh, I would like to thank all uh, the supporters, all the donors, uh, because such conferences wouldn't be able to, uh, to make uh, if we wouldn't have... Uh, donors and donations and for sure uh, we are very happy if you uh, want to support us too and uh, to make a little donation for this conference 
So as said, uh, once every month, another conference, and I hope that uh, you will join again and we will see you again. So thank you for this uh, conference and have a good evening or a good day for USA, California. Michael, have a good day and good evening for all the others. See you. Thank you. Thank you.